This Class Act Sports interview is brought to you by Mile High Salute Barbecue Sauce. Class Act Sports welcomes former NFL running back, future Hall of Famer, Terrell Davis. TD, thanks for joining. How you doing, Jared? I'm doing well, man. I, I, like I said, uh, I kind of like the way that, that rolled off the tongue a little bit. Future Hall of Famer, man. We'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking about that, you know, you played seven years in the league. And uh, you had the most dominant career in such a short time span, similar to what Barry Sanders was able to accomplish. But in about two or three years, you racked up 30, 40 plus touchdowns, a couple thousand yards, just yeah. going haywire out there in, in, in uh, Denver. So what's that like for you to be able to, to reflect on your career? And do you think you're deserving of a Hall of Fame, even though you didn't play 10, 15 years? You know, I think for me, it, it, the Hall of Fame was never something I've ever wanted to, uh, you know, wanted to accomplish. I think when you first start playing, you just you, you kind of play year to year, and you just say, I'm going to go as hard as I can play, I'm going to do the best I can, and I want to win a number of championships. At the end of the day, you look back on it, and you kind of see, well, you know, the, the sort of the path that you, um, that you led, and you say, well, you know, when you listen to everybody else who says that's kind of Hall of Fame material, you know, two championships, uh, MVP, some other things that I've done, then you really start to say, "Wow, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't realize that I was doing that well when I was playing." But now that it's all said and done, and I, and I look back on it, you know, I'm, I'm proud of what I've done, and all the talk about the Hall of Fame, I can't do anything to change that now. You know, um, it, it is what it is, and if if I'm able to be inducted, then that's fine. If not, I'm still, I'm still okay. It can never take away from what I've done. It can only add to it. No doubt about it. And we'll be the first ones there, uh, God willing, to, uh, to interview you when you do get inducted into the hall. Yeah. you be the first one, Jerry. Thanks, T. We appreciate that, T.D. <laughs> so, uh, you, know, you know, we're on the heels of the AFC Championship game, uh, Jet Steelers. Huge game, uh, a game that you've had a lot of experience with, played in that game twice, came out successful on the winning end both times. Talk about what it was like for you to be able to play in a game like that, of that magnitude, and was it just another game as usual, or were you thinking, oh my goodness, one more game like this, and now I'm playing in the Super Bowl? I've always treated every game the same, Jared, you know, to be honest with you, and I think when you, if you make a game bigger than what it is, a lot of times it's going to show. And, and also, I'll say that if you, if you wait for a big game and then all of a sudden you want to give an extra effort, then what were you doing the other games when, they, when you thought they weren't as, poor, as important? So to me, every game is important. So the AFC Championship game, you know, we played in there uh, twice. And, you know, again, to me, it was just going through my checklist. When I played the game, it was all about making sure that, uh, you know, I knew my assignments. Uh, I was going to run hard, and I was going to be accountable. And at the end of the day, if you have 53 guys with that same mentality, then you're going to have a championship team. And that's really what it boiled down to, is people being accountable, people saying that I know my assignment, I know my job, I know what I have to do, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to try to do more than, than what I'm capable of doing. That was it. Now, being it was a championship game, did I think about it? Absolutely. I think we all did. But I never allowed that to, to, to really seep into my consciousness about it's a championship game. And if you win this next week or two weeks from now, you're going to be playing in the Super Bowl. I never allowed that to really t consume me too much. And that's why I think we were able to play well in those big games. Now, you're speaking of those big games. You were down 10 nothing at halftime uh, to the New York Jets. Victor Green's New York Jets. You know, he's yeah. working with Class Act Sports. What was that like for you? Uh, you know, what were you thinking to get back on track, you know, going back out of half? You know, the first half was, um, it was tricky. We we're at home, and here we are, uh, we're down 10 nothing. But all year, we've had to rally. You know, we were the uh, defending champions that year, so we've had to fight and battle for four quarters. And being down 10 nothing, we knew we had an office that could put points on the board pretty quickly. And so we just tried not we tried not to panic, and we sort of got a break. I think it was the third quarter when we kicked off our kicking team. We were kicking into the wind, so when we kicked off, the ball started coming back towards our our, uh, our cover team. They didn't see it. We ended up uh, uh, recovering that uh, on that kick, and I think we went in the score after that. So that gave us momentum, and we cut and we sort of took that momentum throughout the third and fourth quarter, 
and they had a couple of mistakes going on in the third quarter that kind of flipped the whole game around. I think Curtis Martin fumbled or fumbled, and uh, uh, we had some other big plays. But uh, that was it, really, man. We just it was just us. We just kept working hard and kept working at it, and things worked out for us. Well, we'll probably be interviewing uh, Curtis next week, so we'll make sure to mention uh, that you that you said brought that <laughs> he knows, up. He knows he fumbled the ball. It's all right. <laughs> Don't let bygones be bygones. No, absolutely. Uh, what was your most memorable playoff experience? You know, I've, I've had in my short career, I've had a few of them, but I think the one experience, and this is it's kind of weird when people ask me that question, and the one thing I think about every time is is the play that John Mobley made our linebacker uh, for Denver, when he knocked down a pass from Brett Favre, which was the last play of the game um, for the for the Packers in Super Bowl 32. And the reason it was so big was, was, was because that was the culmination of, uh, you know, everything we worked for. That was it. That's what we've all, every team sets out in camp. They want to win a Super Bowl. And when, that, when, the, when the final whistle goes off and it is now official that you are now world champions, that's, you know, the, the feeling is really indescribable. And so that play, I was on the sideline with Shannon and John Elway, and we were sitting there, and they had a chance to go down the field and score a touchdown to tie the game up. And I, I remember just saying, God, just give me this one play. Just no more miracles from Brett Favre. Knock the ball down, pick it off, do something. It was fourth and probably eight or something like that. And if they had caught the pass, the drive would continue. They may have scored a touchdown went to overtime, who knows what would have happened. But that play I thought was, was big, and that play looms in my head every, every every time I think about that game, that play stands out to me. And that's just typical TD, taking the humble route, you know, 157 yards that game, three touchdowns, and you're talking about a defensive play at the end of the game. Yeah. When, when you woke up, the day of the Super Bowl, did you know that you were going to have ultimately the game of your career, the game of your life? No. No, again, I think that the night before, a couple of guys were, were sort of uh, saying, I think Shannon and, and, and myself said that uh, he's going to get the Super Bowl MVP trophy. And I said, no, I'm going to get it. <laughs> so I think we all said that. I think some other guys, I think uh, Byron Chamberlain had talked about that as well. And Brad Smith, we were all talking about who's going to get that trophy. What was great about that is that now you have people who aren't sitting there saying, I'm going to rely on somebody else to make a play. I'm going to rely on somebody else to win this game. If you've got 11 guys saying they're going to win that trophy, imagine what they have to bring that day to get that trophy. And that's what happened. We had 11 guys who were just willing to go out there and play hard, and they believed that they were going to get that trophy. Uh, it just so happened that, that when you're running back and, you know, in this game, only a few people will get that trophy. I mean, it's, it, most, most of the time it's going to be a quarterback or a running back, maybe a receiver. But um, I, I just had an exceptional game that day. I just felt like, I was my hometown was San Diego. I was back home, and uh, I played. I played in that stadium a few times, but I had never won in that stadium. And so that was really the, that was the first or second time I had won in that stadium prior to that game. Well, TD, we'll touch we'll touch on the games that are upcoming this weekend. But I want to stick on this point. You said you're you're in San Diego, yep. and uh, you're waiting the birth of your first child. God willing, uh, looking for that little guy being born. Mm -hmm. Can you compare? the type of anticipation for you waiting for him to be born, you and your wife waiting for him to be born, uh, in addition or against, let's just say, you waiting for your Super Bowl MVP appearance? Yeah, man, Jared, you know what? It's, um, I think there's some parallels. The only difference is that with him, there's a time, but there, the time kind is kind of a, elusive. You know, we, we're, we're anticipating this big event, but it's not set in stone when he's going to arrive. But uh, the excitement level, I think, is, is probably a little bit more than than the Super Bowl, to be honest with you. Super Bowl, obviously, you know, the day, everything, you know, is there. But this one, I don't know, man. This might this might outdo the bowl, man. <laughs> <laughs> this really might be a, a notch above that. John Elway behind center. Uh, do you think that helped you? I'm sure it helped you. But to what magnitude did you both help each other? He was waiting to get the monkey off his back, waiting for a running back like yourself. You know, you are an elite back in the league with an elite quarterback. Talk about what you two were able to uh, do for one another and complement each other so well. Yeah, that's, that's, you know, Jared, that's a good point. Um, you know, John has been in that game a few times. I think he was in that game three times before we had gone back, and he had never had a chance to win it. 
But I think a lot of that, too, was the fact that, you know, here's a guy that was really a one-man show. Every team he's been on, it's been John, and then he's had some makeshift receivers, and he's had a, you know, decent defense, but there was no other complimentary piece for him. Now, you know, I show up, and all of a sudden we have a running game and we have a passing game, a guy who's, you know, obviously a Hall of Famer. Of course he helped my career. I mean, you know, it's, it's nice to, to go into a game and know that we have two options. We're not just a one-dimensional team where we just run the football or we just throw the football. If teams want to play us with eight in the box, hey, you know what, we'll throw. You want to go ahead and, and play us in a nickel uh, package and, and, and play five or six in the box, then we'll run the football. So, but the, obviously the one thing I, I, I kind of wish was that John and I came in about the same time. You know, like Troy Aikman and, and Emmett Smith and Michael Irvin. If we had uh, played where we both were, were on the same age, you know, John was uh, obviously a lot older than I was, but, you know, it would have been nice to play with John for more than four years and, and to see how many Super Bowls we could have won. So it, it would have been nice. Did you have a TD? Did you have the mentality, I'm Terrell Davis, I'm TD, I can score at will, no one can stop me? Yeah, a lot of people might uh, – like. I, me personality wise, I'm I'm sort of you know I'm a nonchalant guy. I'm, right. I'm not arrogant. Um, but when you're in that game, I think you have to have a sense of of cockiness. You got to feel like you're the best player out there, and you just can't doubt it. And then no no great player ever has any self doubt about where he stands when he's on that football field. And I didn't either. When I was in, on that field, I don't care if Barry Sanders was across the ball or on the other side of that field, uh, Emmitt Smith, uh, I don't care, Walter Payton. I felt like I was the best running back in that game. Now, it, I don't care what anybody else said because it didn't matter to me. Right. What mattered to me was that, the way I felt. And so I, I, tried to, I, I tried to play like I was the best out there or the best in the business. As you were, as you were. You know, uh, coming out, six-round draft pick. How does someone like yourself slip to the sixth round? Potentially one of the biggest steals in the history of the NFL draft. How does that happen, TD? I don't know. You have to talk to the executives, man. You have to talk to the owners. <laughs> you got to talk to the scouts and the head coaches because it's not an exact science. We all know that the NFL, they, they, they look at the measurables. They look at the 40 times, the bench press, how fast you run the shuttle, um, if it looks good to the eye when you have shorts on. And really the bottom line is football's football. And for me, when I when I try to grade players or look at a talent, I'm looking more at the tapes. I'm looking at, okay, can this guy play football? Because a lot of times you don't look like you might be a good player. In terms of, you know, you may not test well. For example, I didn't test well at the combine. I think I ran a 4.6 in the 40-yard dash. Uh, I was probably middle of the pack and everything else with three cone shuttles. I mean, all that stuff. Um, I wasn't the fastest. I didn't have a high vertical leap. But you take that same person, you put them in a game where there's other elements to the game. There's passion behind the game. There's the fact that you have pads on. There's a there's a heart issue. You know, a, a, a issue with you know someone's heart. You can't measure that. Right. So there's a lot of there's a lot of the things you can't measure that scouts have to, they got to guess on, you know, so for me, it was one of those deals, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with it, a lot of guys have been passed up, I'm not the first one, Tom Brady, sixth round draft pick, right. um, you know, so it happens, 